Good afternoon and welcome to Robin Minds. My name is Isabella Adediji. The list, the ministerial list, is finally out. President Bola Tinubu has forwarded a list of 28 names to the Senate for approval. Now, social media has been awash with a lot of comments. People wondering why there are only 28 names when the Constitution expects that there will be representation from each of the 36 states. Questions like, should we expect more names? And why were those states omitted? And when we look at the list, what does it say for representation, for women in particular, and for young persons? Now, to discuss the ministerial list on Robbie Minds, I have with me a social commentator and policy analyst in the person of Michael Faloko. Welcome to Robbie Minds. Thank you for having me. And we're also joined by a public affairs analyst via Zoom, Shion Akiyemi. Welcome to Robbie Minds. With you, Good Michael. Afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I'll start with you, Michael. Um, when you first saw the list of those 28 names, what came to mind? I mean, we've had to wait almost 60 days, just like the Constitution says, to see this list. Were you surprised? Were you happy with it? And what were your expectations? Were they met? Um, to start with, um, having to wait for 60 days is within the confines of what the Constitution guarantees. You know, the Constitution allows for the President to have 60 days of breather for him to come up with a list of uh, ministerial candidates. And he has done that with a day to spare. Now, when I saw the list, the first thing that came to mind was um, it's a balanced list. Let's be honest. Um, we must understand that um, politics and governance they're like a Siamese twins. And often than not, when, when the politicking ends and the governance begin, all of those that participated in politicking will definitely, a couple of them with competence, will definitely come into governance. Because as a result of it, that's the reward of their hard work, so to speak. Okay, so you were happy with the balance between, I'll say, bureaucracy as well bureaucracy, as Bureaucracy, technocracy, absolutely. Yes. You will look at that list. It's a list of, you know, Old hands, bureaucrats. technocrats, bureaucrats, and all of that. And if you look at what the president has said, you know, before he became president, and whilst he, you know, in his, you know, assumption of office, he's talked about hitting the ground running. It's not like as if we've had, you know, instances where the ground has been hit and the running has, you know, has been achieved. But as it were now, you see that there's a balanced list whereby, if they are deployed to appropriate MDAs or ministries, as it were now. Um, you will see that these people are, you know, to some level of, or degree, competent to handle such ministries. Okay, I'll move to Shion Akiyemi. Now, what were your impressions of this list when you saw it? Um, do you agree with Michael that the list is balanced between technocrats and the politicians who have been rewarded for hard work done? So, I disagree slightly with him. Uh, for me, I believe if we continue to do things the same way, we can not get a different result. This list is kind of similar to what uh, President Mamadou Bari also presented in uh, 2015, which had more of politicians. Based on the things that we currently have, uh, we have uh, six former lawmakers, we have uh, four, uh, four former governors, we have uh, three serving, uh, three serving uh, lawmakers as well in, in that list. For me, it's more of a settlement list, uh, more of a list to settle party loyalties rather than what should focus more on uh, governance and then more of technocrats. But what we have now is more of a settlement list to, uh, to settle uh, loyalists and then to settle uh, those that work hard, just like you said, for him to get inside. But we need to prioritize uh, governance at this uh, critical stage. And even looking at uh, the number of women that we have, uh, we just have 25% uh, of them are women. Whereas uh, even the uh, uh, affirmative action uh, stipulated in the national agenda policy of 2006 that says that uh, we should have at least 35% uh, of uh, women, and we are hoping that will be achieved when probably when the second batch uh, comes in. Thank you. Okay. So will you be expecting a second list? And I'm saying this because we have the Constitution saying that there's representation of at least one from each state. And we have certain states that have been omitted from this list. So um, do you think there should be a second list? Or do you think that having 28 names might be signaling 
a reduction of the cost of governance and maybe the merging of ministries and MDAs in general? Okay, thank you for that question. You see, whether we like it or not, there will be more um, um, nominees for the ministerial slot because the president must work according to the constitution. The constitution says once one minister nominee per state. And as it, as it were, 11 states have been omitted from that list. So you have Adamawa, Baelsa, Kano, Kebi, Lagos, Plato, Zamfara, and the likes have been omitted for that list. So I'm certain that the, the president will nominate more persons into those lists. Obviously, for whatever reasons best known to him, um, that is why we've had the first 28. However, I want to speak to what he mentioned. You talked about uh, the demography of that list. Yes, we have 25% female, we have 75% male. Um, we know that there's a possibility of meeting that 35% affirmative action that he has mentioned. Um, I recall that um, during the... The possibility in a second list? Is in a second list, that's what I mean. In a second list, that's what I mean. And when we now talk about... Um, I, I just want to you know, digress a bit when he talked about the issue of um, settling... Uh, politicians. And when you talk about settling politicians, I mean, one name that was surprising to at least a lot of people was um, the former governor of River State, Nien Somwike, yes, Somwike, who is from the opposition party, the PDP, making that list. Does that also fit into his argument about being settled for hard work during the campaign trail? It's a function of narrative, to be honest. It's a function of narrative. I would say, for want of argument or for a second opinion, a second narrative that Nesom Wike has been an outstanding governor in a state. No PDP state or no PDP governor or no PDP member will say Nesom Wike hasn't, you know, successfully led his state for the past eight years and deliver. This is a man that has been named Mr. Project within a state and outside the state. Many of the politicians as it were today, both current and former, have all, you know, commissioned one project or the other within a state. And now, I must add to this, Nesom Wike being on the list is... You know, it's an indication of walking across party, party, party aisle. If you recall in 1999, President Olusha Gombasanjo himself did something similar by, you know, walking across party lines to nominate um, Chief Bolaige as the Attorney General of the Federation. So I see no reason why we should, you know, cry foul in the face of competence. I understand the argument that Nisham Wike is an old politician, but it's an old politician that has comfortably done his work, and the testament is there for everyone to see. Okay, I'll move to you, Shewo. And this, um, this question has to do with the um, feedback, or rather the answer you gave me to the last question. And is that um, sentiment on social media from young people that there's a recycling of politicians? There are certain names on this list that have been in government for a very long time. And some people believe that might just be a reward and just having the same old people. What does that say for our polity? Do we need more experienced hands or should this list reflect people that may have not been given the chance but have done well maybe in the private sector? Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so let's say for instance, probably I'll start from Wiki where my uh, uh, colleague just uh, ended. For instance, Wiki was a governor, or former governor Wiki was former governor in River State, he just finished. But for me, instead of just being selfish and then just taking up all the positions, so why not nominate a star cabinet member from your cabinet and nominate him as a governor? That way you still have your power there. Rather than you going there and again and recycling yourself as a political leader, you've served as a minister before, this is not your first time. You've served as a governor for two terms, which, was, which is uh, eight years. Now you are going back again as a minister. Why not nominate someone uh, from your cabinet who worked and they did very well while you were in government to become the minister and take up that position rather than you going there again? So I think for me that's the argument and not you just coming there. If we continue to recycle these old people, then how do we, how do we test other people as well to get to have that experience as well? Also, even beyond that, are you saying that is uh, is some wicked that is the only idea? Cerebral or intellectual person in the whole of River State to take up that ministerial role. Not just uh, governor, former governor Yeso Mike, but the same thing also applies to Malam Nasir Erufai. The same thing applies to uh, uh, former governor David Umay. Uh, okay, I'll move to you, uh, Michael. And this is to go back to that point you made about walking across party lines. Now, when you look at someone like Wiki, yes, he's of the PDP, but he was very supportive 
of President Bola Tinubu. So are we expecting other people from the opposition that maybe did not come out in full support, but they are good at what they do and they should be given that chance? And I also want you to respond about, to the question about having new hands. How do these new people, whether they are young people, women that have not been in government, get that opportunity to also, well, I would say, maybe strengthen their hand and contribute to national development? Thank you for that question. I'll take the latter first. Um, I'm, a, you know, I'm a, a full supporter of any young person in governance. As much as we want young people in governance, we'll equally want people that will be able to do that demography proud. Now, you're talking about new hands. We have a system today, or the country as it were today, is in dire need of administrators. We, we, you know, literally we need to hit the ground running. Things are not going as they ought to go. And as much as we want new hands, as much as we want new faces, as much as we want, you know, cerebral people that are new into positions, we must work with experience. We must work with experience in the sense that every minister is going to have to go and deal with a ministry. And without prejudice, the ministries themselves are the bane of where we are today. And you need competent hands that can administratively handle any ministry or portfolio assigned to them. So, yeah, the, the argument can be for either, you know, either argument can, can, can work. But I would say that in this on wiki, for instance, in either works or transport, you know, we can readily say what will happen in this nation. You know, without speaking for anyone's um, um, potential uh, nomination or acceptance of nomination, I believe that we are at a crucible in this country where we must make certain that apart from experience, apart from knowledge, apart from competence, we have the people that have the character to deliver that role that we give to them. Because no matter if you bring a Harvard Law graduate in any ministry and they can't you know, you know, work with the workforce within that ministry, their competence won't show. That is where we are. Okay, I'll move to you, Shiong, and this time is to focus on the civil service, focus on the backbone of these ministries, the permanent secretaries, the people who work in these ministries. Do you feel that they wield more influence and more power and say the minister doesn't have as much um, authority or as much influence as we're attributing to that office? Uh, well, I think the boats have their powers, the boats have their responsibilities, the boats have their functions. For instance, based on my knowledge, I think it's the minister that we are, they are, we are attending the FEC meeting. And it's at the FEC meeting that they take high-level decisions concerning each uh, ministry, projects that will be approved, projects that will be implemented. Although, despite uh, going for FEC meeting and getting approval, we still have uh, we still have people in those ministries who will be the implementers who are the ones that actually execute uh, those projects. So it's more or less working in harmony that can give the best results for each of these ministries, rather than seeing uh, rather than seeing each other as as enemies or being as the guys. It won't really help us, but the minister should work very well and effectively with uh, the palm seg, and then the palm seg should be should work well with uh, the staff of the ministry. It's just a we need a good work harmony in the ministry for we to give for those ministers to give their best results. And do you feel that a new hand, maybe someone who has years of experience doing administration work in the private sector, might not be able to deliver, considering all the politics in these ministries? Well, to some extent, okay. Let me go this way. Uh, when the uh, Madame Ungozi Okonji Wigala was brought from, uh, should I say, the private sector or from the ING, yet she delivered. Uh, Madame Ungozi uh, uh, was, was also brought from, was not in government before, yet she delivered. So I don't really believe that uh, uh, when we bring people from the private sector, they won't really deliver. Even in the list that we have, we already have people from the private sector. Does that mean they won't deliver? For instance, I think uh, uh, Mr. Wadi uh, chairman of Chapel Hill or so, uh, yeah, I think uh, he, is, he is from the private sector, yet we are expecting him to perform. So that I'm not, yeah, experience matters, but definitely is not really uh, the, the primary thing that, the primary thing that is expected for them to deliver. For instance, those that are coming as well, the former Senate, the former lawmakers that I referenced that were on the list, 
Some of them have not been in the ministry before, yet we are expecting them to deliver. So okay. that doesn't really, for me, it's not really a major criteria. Okay. I'll move to you, Michael, and I'd like you to respond to that because um, having that political finesse or maybe being politically savvy, is that so key to run a ministry or is it more about the competence of being able to carry out these administrative tasks and maybe also leveraging the influence they have? I think um, I would agree to him, um, um, but defer to some of the things he mentioned. I think it's a function of having the experience of your environment. Um, our ministries today are more politicized than even politics. And you must be able or understand how to navigate within the waters of the ministry politics. Yes, they are your team. They are answerable to you. But at the end of the day, if you don't lead them rightly, accurately, um, you will find that whatever you get as, a, um, as an approval in fact, and they are meant to implement, you don't get the right implementation. So, and, and, and I think that we must understand that um, these people have already been running their ministries even before the appointment of ministers. So the appointment of ministers in itself, you know, disrupts whatever, you know, structure is already in place as it were. Now, as, as, as we are now, the permanent secretary is the head of the ministry reporting to the, to the federal, head, uh, federal head of service. Now, now, when a minister comes in, it becomes the permanent secretary reporting. So there are a lot of human resource issues there. And you need competence, whether from the private sector or the public sector. That's why I say I agree with it. You know, you will have people come from the private sector and fit in properly because they have human skills, they have, you know, relational skills and all of that. And they have the competence to drive the team forward. Um, you will have people that will come from the public sector equally that will do not too well. And we have examples of that here and there. But I'm saying that it works well for someone that has been in administration within that setting and understands the politics the mindset and the psyche of those that he's leading. Okay. I'll move to you now, um, Sheon. And are there names that you felt should have been on this list? I know before the 59th day when the president released this list, there were certain names that were just flying all over the internet, people who are taking it upon themselves to more or less do the president's work. Do you think there are some names that um, should have been on this list or should be on a second list that we're expecting? Uh, well, to be honest, I don't really have specific names, but I just trust uh, this government, this administration, to uh, to make the best decision for us, to make the best decision on behalf of the citizens and choose the best of the people in our society to be part of those uh, ministerial lists that will come up in the second batch. Yeah, this first batch is, let's say it's gone, yeah, but we can still remedy it in the second batch that the people are respecting. Just like uh, my colleague said that the... Uh, 11 states have not been represented. So people that are coming from those 11 states that have not been represented, we are expecting the best, the best technocrats from, the, uh, from those states to emerge as uh, the ministers that will, that will be nominated to, uh, for screening at the National Assembly. So we still believe there is still hope for us, and then we are still hoping for the best. What about you? Do you have any particular names that you were expecting on the list? In all honesty, I didn't have anybody in mind that, you know, spoke to me as to um, making the uh, ministerial list. However, I must point out that even when the president was, you know, nominating special advisors, you will see the competence in the people that he wanted them to work closely with him, you know, and you will see where his mindset is, you know, is, is tilting towards. If you look at the, the issues with respect to ministerial lists, it's, it's more political than, than even your desire as, as a president because uh, the nominations come from, from the states up until the federal um, level and they are collated. Often than not, you have been told, oh, give me three or five names from your state and the, president, or the presidency will say, oh, I want this, I don't want that, and, and all of that. But if it were for um, an individual to choose, you, you should look at the... The, you know, the appointments being made by the president with regards to his special advisors, and then you will now see the level of competency that he's trying to bring to the fold. But within this list in itself, you will see that technocrats there, um, Latif Fagbemi SAN, is one of, you know, top 10 brilliant lawyers in this country. You, you, you know, you can't have his name elsewhere. Uh, even the ex-governors, David Umayi, old hand, but he did significantly well in his state. Nasir Rao will fight the same thing. So as much as we want new faces, we must equally know that there must be a balance. There are young minds there. Dr. Betty, uh, Betty the, 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 female, the female doctor from, from, from um, Cross River, she's 
an equally brilliant mind. I think she's 35 or 36 there about. So we have this demography being infused into that list. What we require, what we demand, is that each and everybody, upon their confirmation by the Senate, should deliver the mandate of whichever portfolio is assigned and to speaking them. speaking of whichever portfolio, how important is it to have that match? Is it like round pegs in round holes? Because sometimes in the past administrations, we've seen certain ministers and we're asking, why is this minister handling this ministry? Why not a different ministry? How important is that? Or is it just more about that administrative skill and being able to manage the politics? No, I think, I think there, there must be, you know, round pegs and round holes. I think people must be matched with portfolios based on their competencies. Yes, you know, with the, with the former governors, you will, you will care to think that, oh, because they've been able to oversee different ministries, different projects, different agencies, they will fit well in certain areas. But even within those former governor circles, there are certain portfolios you expect them to handle. For instance, let's take Wiki. I would expect a Wiki to either be Minister of Works or Minister of Transport. That way you can readily identify his input as a minister, as opposed to saying, oh, Minister of Special Duties, for instance. Um, there are some other names, like Latif Fagimi that I mentioned earlier, you expect him to be the Attorney General. You don't expect him to, to be the Minister of uh, uh, Labor and Productivity. You know, I expect that the presidency will work with each of their CVs and make certain that, you know, they are matched with their competency. Okay. I'll move to you, Sharon. And I want to know, um, looking at past administrations, um, how much impact did these ministers make? Can we expect to see measurable impact in the work of the ministers? Or is it more about the, the ministry themselves and managing the, the politics that happens that might not allow them to achieve as much as they might have set out to? Uh, number one, even in our regular workplaces, there is office politics. And then uh, we must sort of, we have to play it sort of. Either, when, either you are active or inactive, it's still for me, it's still, your inactiveness is politics, your activeness is politics. So for you to achieve, uh, for the organization to grow sort of, we must play a positive politics to ensure that we are able to get uh, the outcome that we really want. So I won't really, I will encourage more of positive politics within the ministry for them to achieve the uh, development goals that they hope to achieve rather than playing the bad politics. Because right now, a lot has happened in the country. Our inflation rate is high, the dollar exchange rate is high, and there are so unemployment rates is there. We have insecurity that we are battling with. So many issues that we are battling with. And it's not at this juncture that we have to be divided on who takes what glory or not. What we must be after is let's work together to achieve these goals for the development of the country. Our focus right now should be on the development of the country rather than just chasing some selfish interests or some parochial interests because a lot is at stake right now. So all hands should be on deck for the development of the country. And then which if, uh, if the ministry, if they're able to, develop, if they're able to implement developmental projects that benefit the whole country, one is for the glory of the minister, is for the glory of uh, the BAMSEC, is even the part of the glory of even the civil servants that are working in the ministry. And ultimately, it's for the glory of even the president. And even generally, we Nigerians, we are the one benefiting from it. So it's of the glory of everybody. But actually, everybody will benefit from it. So let's, it's just better to push bad politics aside and work towards the development and growth of the, of the country at large. Okay, I'd like to ask you, Michael, can we really measure the impact of a minister? And when we look at past administrations, do any names come to mind that you'd say, okay, yes, this minister had this economic impact? I mean, is this list and the ministers that will be appointed, the silver bullet to a lot of the challenges that Sheon spoke about? I mean, we have a weakening Naira, the dollar has been, Naira has been floated. We also have some of the challenges with... Um, the high cost of living because okay. of the removal of subsidy. Right. You see, the thing is, nobody is a silver bullet until the task is handed to them and they start to deliver. In past administrations, we've had people like Ngozi, Ngozi Okonje Wela, who did exceptionally well in our time. We've had, um, um, what's it called, uh, this other woman. Uh, we've had... Um, Obieze Kwesili. Quite a number that. of Quite them. Quite a number of them. And the point is, what do you want to be known for? in your role, in your duty, 
in your service to the country. What, what do you want to be known for? What I do think, you want to be known I for? I think that's a good place to bring this conversation to the end. That in itself, it's not a silver bullet, but it's what happens after they've been assigned Absolutely. their portfolios. Thank Absolutely. you very much, Michael Faloku, for thank joining for us yeah, on you. Robbie Minds. And thank you, Shion Akiemi, for your contributions on the show. We'll be going on a quick break. Do join us again. And that was Maserati by Ola Kira. I hope you were also vibing to that. Um, he's popularly known by his name, Ade Ebenezer, who is a singer, songwriter, record producer, multi-instrumentalist, and his music um, fuses Afro-pop, Afro-beat, and I dare say some R&B. Ola Kira, welcome to Robbie Minds. <laughs> and thank you for giving me some of the two of the tune as the music video was going on. I have to ask, what has been the high point of your career so far? Yeah, my high point is the fame, like the, the you know, the hit I had, Maserati, of course. And the high point, let me just say, the high point is when I got, you know, endorsed by Maserati, you know, being the ambassador. That's the first African artist to achieve that. So it's more like... And if, it's not even a dream come true. It's something you don't even dream about. You don't even expect it's going to happen. I, I mean, I remember when the news came out announcing your ambassador, and I was just thinking, like, were you expecting that when you were singing that song? Uh, were you speaking it into existence? Or it just came to you while you were writing? I, I wasn't even, like, I was, isn't, I didn't have that thought. Like, no blink of that thought in my mind. And even when we traveled to Dubai for the surprise, my manager told me that we are going for uh, a video shoot. And we got to the warehouse. I'm like, okay, is it a warehouse shoot? Like, what kind of shoot is this? He said, let's just go in. I will get in. I saw camera. I saw people starting. I saw the Maserati. I saw people. I was like, wow. Was that the first time you saw a Maserati? No, that was not, that was not the first time. But, you know, the latest Maserati, that's what they, that, that, of that year, that's what they gave me. And um, my manager, they didn't even come to pick me with Maserati. They came to pick me with another car. So I won't suspect anything. So it was like they just planned it, and it was a huge surprise for me because I wasn't thinking about it. I didn't even thought about it. What so, yeah. inspired the song? Um, I think it's my love for luxury vehicles, especially Maserati. I like Maserati a lot. I've been like wanted to like experience it, like feel it. So that's how I st started with Baby Come, Baby Hopping my Maserati. That's how I started. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Um, what, what has influenced your music? I mean, you do a bit of R&B, Afro-pop, Afro-beat. Um, who are some of your influences? Yeah, um, Fela, of course, Fela number one, Fela Nicola Poe, um, Sonia Day, Ebenezer Albi, um, Obisiri, a lot of Fuji artists as well, because I, I, I listened to Fuji and Juju when I was growing up. So, and then the, the you know, like Two-Face and the rest too, you know, actually uh, inspires me as, as well. And other international acts, like um, Boys to Men, Style okay. Club, um, Boys to Men, Backstreet Boys, Celine Dion. I listened to R&B a lot when I was a kid, so yeah. That, that's taking me down mm -hmm. um, childhood. I think if you grew up in the 90s, early 2000s, uh, Backstreet, Celine yes, Dion. Um, okay, so do you have any particular artist, um, local or international, that you would say would be your dream feature or a collaboration, like maybe a whiskey, David Doe, Tiwa. Um, Definitely. Who, who would you Tiwa like Savage. to? Tiwa Savage. I've actually had something with um, David, uh, hopefully whiskey, but right about now, Tiwa, like, we're, we're, on, we're in talk because um, I'm dropping a project, an album, or probably an EP, and I want her to, you know, be in, in, the, in the project. So, yeah, we're, we're in talk with, with her, so, yeah. Okay. Tell us more about the project you're dropping. Um, what has inspired it? What can we expect from it? What sound? Um, yeah. Do you have any collaborations already? I have. I've, like, uh, so far, so good. I've, I've gone on with, with Mr. Easy, Quissy Otto, Candy Blicks, many more. And Tour Savage as well, like, we're working towards that. And Aria Star as well. So um, I've been working on that project for a while because I took a break for a long period of time because of, I had some, you know, set back, had some issues, but when I got back on track, I've been spending time to achieve this. So that's why I said it's, a, it's either an album or an EP. It depends on the time frame, how we, we can be able to achieve this whole, the whole thing. Do you have a, a particular date that you want to expose us to this music? Um, 
Is it this year? Is this something that we should expect next Definitely year? Definitely this year. That's why I said, it's, it's, if I can make the album, make, make it up um, for the album, there definitely is going to be, the, be an EP, but it's going to be this year because we're running out of time already. So maybe in the next two months, the project will be out. But I dropped two singles, Ileke and Kisses. Wish to be, that's Ileke and um, Kisses. So that's not like the first official single this year. Yeah, okay. No. Yeah. Okay, so two months. I think that's not too far. Now, <laughs> you spoke about that quiet period because you came on the scene, you were everywhere, the uh, song was charting, <laughs> you know, just topping the charts across, and then you went away. Um, can you tell us some about the challenges you went through during that low period? Yeah, um, I had um, addiction. I had um, serious addiction, sex addiction, precisely. And uh, it was really like getting to where I couldn't control myself at some point. So I went for therapy and um, I had, I got hypnotized. I had quiet time. I, you know, celebrate for a while. I think why I'm sharing this is because of people who are passing through that as well. You know, there's always, you know, an answer to that, you know, so just, just don't keep it to yourself. Sure, um, shout out to my friend, one of my friends like that. So it's just like, what's going on, man? You've been, you've been low key. And something about those things, when you don't do, when you're not functioning, you start getting depressed. So, but yeah, I'm back on trial. This, this sex addiction, do you, do, have you been able to identify some of the triggers? And do you feel that being an artist with all the girls, the money, the fame, the fake life, the clubs, the, those things contribute to that? Definitely. Like for my, my own example, I, I'm being loved by ladies. Like I'm a ladies guy. I don't know. I don't know how to put that. Like I was, I, I was brought up by a single mother. So I, I relate more with ladies. I have more female friends than male friends. So somehow, somehow, there was like, you know, a distraction in between. So I was being really distracted at some point, like I said. So um, the same thing can, can make it, you know, worse. <laughs> like, it's like a plus thing, you get Like, it's a plus thing, yeah. And I'd like you to set the record straight concerning this um, issue with the church and um, I think four choristers oh. in the choir. Um, how did you navigate that and your faith and, and get back on track? Yeah, you know, like, it, that, the church, um, I was suspended, but I knew that that suspension is still like you've been sacked already. You know, I, I had things with the, with the chorister. I think music is spirit. And with four choristers? Yes. And music is spirit. You know, when you sing in church, that's why sometimes, you know, it's that, it's, we, I, I grew up in church. I started music from church. So, and I, I faced that challenges to, in church. But when I came to the secular world, it, it's, it's more difficult. Like, it's beyond my, I couldn't handle, you know, the whole thing. Because it's just right on my face. So... I, I think it's something that a lot of artists deal, um, deal with. I mean, you see a lot of baby mamas out there. How have yeah. you been able to... Um, stay ahead of that <laughs> i mean despite everything i don't think we've had as many people no. coming out to say they're your baby mama yeah i, I in that aspect i'm i'm disciplined in that aspect yeah i know how to catch fun i know i know how to have a good time but i'm i know where i'm going to i know where i'm coming from so i don't want to like when i'm not ready i'm not ready for that so i'm, I'm disciplined in that aspect and what i learned so far too is you have to be very disciplined you have to learn to discipline yourself self-control and you know yeah that's, that's it. You spoke about um, starting in the church and being suspended. Do you have plans to go back to singing in the church? I mean, <laughs> there are certain artists who release a secular album and then they come out to release a gospel album. Can we be expecting something like that? I, I don't think so because um, I, I do more. I, I, like my sister is Mommy Jill, and I remember we had issues 2008 or there about nine or there about because she said I, she noticed that I like singing secular music because I feel like it's just me that's just me out of all my siblings all, most of them are pastors I'm just the one that just I'm just different I, I'm all, an, another vibe so that's just my style I, I find it very easy to write secular music so it's just my field and it's my calling and I'm proud of it because now my song is one of the um, first Afro beat songs to go global like international and I'm proud to be part of this generation so yeah I don't think I'm doing gospel anytime soon, but yeah. Gospel. But do you still have like a spiritual life? Do you still do things in the church? Maybe not music per se. Yeah, I, I, actually, I feel like the, what I notice is you, it's not even just about going to church. I think building your relationship with God. Because I remember there was a time I was communicating, like even till date. But I know I, sometimes I, you know, this belief thing, you have to believe and you have to strongly 
or you know hold it strong. Like I used to talk to God, like when that Maserati deal, I told I told God, I said, God, I want this song to go viral, and it went viral. So there's a communication between me and God. I see, like I can literally talk to Him. Like I'm not seeing it, but I I could feel like He is hearing me and He's ready to help me. So that that's the relationship. Yeah. Okay. What do you think about Afrobeat and it's gaining a lot of traction um, around the world. Do you see it as something that has come to stay, or is this a fad and then we'll move to something else? No, Afrobeat is, is the future of, of all general music. I, it, it's a happy vibe. There's no way you want to, you want to listen to Afrobeat. You won't feel it. Like, it's just like bringing the, li you know, the, 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 the life from you, you know. So yeah, Afrobeat is the future of, of, you know, of um, all general music. That's what I know. And um, I'm so proud to see numbers like Rema, Bonobo, everybody doing numbers. Like after the other songs, Maserati and the rest, the other songs calm down, numbers, amazing numbers. Like we're global. And yeah. Yes, and, and there's hardly any country you go to now, you're not hearing some records by Afrobeat. Nigerian artists. Yeah. Um, definitely Afrobeat has really um, gone global. Um, you mentioned some names and you've spoken about people you've done collaborations with. Mm -hmm. What I want to know is, do you have friends in the industry, people that are your peeps, like uh, people you roll with? Yeah, in industry is kind of like cockers, like, you know, people you roll with. And I, I've learned to realize that you don't force things. So the little friend I could make, yes. I just so who's in pass. your cockers? Or yeah, whose cockers are you I in? I can't really mention because it's just, more like, you know, if you vibe with me, I vibe with you. But definitely, I, I don't want to be like, like a circle thing. I don't believe in that, but that's how it is. But still, I just vibe with you, vibe with me. I don't learn to pass my boundaries. If you're not feeling me, then I just stay. So that's how it is for everybody. I, 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 somebody, someone told me that already, you know, when I was like, guy, this industry is like, your value, as we take feel ourselves. So yeah, that's, that's how the industry is. Are there, are there people you look up to in the industry that you consider as maybe role models, people Definitely. that you go to for maybe advice, advice. that have been very, that played a key role in your growth? Yeah, David is an example. David, shout out to David. He's an amazing person. Like, he likes to carry people along and he has this, you know, to help. Like, I don't know how to express it, but David, shout out to David. Uh, he's like, more like someone I can literally talk to. Like, if... No matter what, if I still hit him up on DM or maybe change his numbers, he's still going to reply, like, what's up? So, yeah. Are there people that you've reached out to that haven't have been as definitely, warm? People definitely. People like who? I don't want to mention names. <laughs> but let me, don't let me cast. <laughs> <laughs> but, but how do you balance being Olakira and also being Ade Ebenezer? How do you um, deal with the fame and deal with um, the pressure to continue to be very successful? Yeah, the pressure, the pressure is really, really serious. Because now, even like two years ago that I was had my heat, compared to now, is more, the game is more serious now. Like, it's really, really serious. Everybody's trying to fight for themselves. So, yeah, I find it very... Uh, um, but at, at, at the same time, you know, there's something... I met a friend, an artist, and he said something, and that thing, I, all, I actually, it's a point, it's a valid point. He said, you know, it, because you, you already had a song, you already had a hit song, doesn't mean you have to be, when you are trying to force it, or you are being so, in, um, in, um, you're so desperate, I don't know how to use that word, that's when you got, got, it, got it wrong. Just do your thing. So that's what I'm trying to do. I don't want to be so, um, like, feeling like. So, so what if in doing your thing, you're not charting the, you're not charting, you're not um, being at the top, you're not going global, it's not going viral. How do you, then yeah. balance um, the need to be commercial to make your money and still also stay true to yourself as an artist. Psychologically, I feel like it's good to not let things pressure you. I've studied that people that doesn't let things, people pressure them or say, you know, they drop song, they are, the, they are really doing good. When you're being pressured and you, you succumb to that, you, give, you create an attention for that, you get it wrong, you, you start sounding serious. But when you make it feel like, yeah, this is me, I know I'm not popping, but I can. I believe in myself. I think that you, 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 you your song will be, will be so original. You, you deliver everything, and yes, most of the songs that are out there are songs that people don't even when they recorded it, they were not even, even like serious about it. You know, that's Afrobeat. Afrobeat is not something. It's a playful. It has to be a happy vibe, and so yeah, I've learned not to be. You know. So I'm just doing my thing. But and, don't and you have... The album, you're going to feel it from the album as well. But don't you have, like, pressure maybe from the 
record label, from show promoters, from um, producers that you've worked with for it to for it to blow or for to go viral? Blow. You know, there's all called stream farm. Now, they, there's a way they manipulate these old numbers. Like you can be at the top and you're not even nobody knows you. So how how does that happen? It I happens. Mean, on so are you saying that people who are streaming, the people that are being paid to maybe stream music robots. and then yeah. robots? Okay. So it's not the number is fake, but you know it's just like a cloud. I think it's normal thing even in the diaspora they are doing that. But Nigerians, you know, many Nigerians when we enter something like this, we will scatter everything. So what so, is the better metric to judge success? Is it by how many shows you're called for, say, during the December period? Is it by doing an international tour? Mm. Is it by streams? Is it by radio play? What, what then is a more um, genuine way or that you say, okay, this yeah, artist is valid, really popping? Yeah, valid uh, yeah, certification. I feel like the streaming is, 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 is valid. You know, streaming is valid because you can see the numbers. I don't, I mean, I don't mean the fake ones. Especially Spotify, you know, you can see everything. From YouTube, you can see the views. You can see, you can see CK, Rema, Calm Down. There's no doubt those are the biggest. You can, the numbers is there, so there's no way you can manipulate that. And um, I think, you know, most Nigerian artists, I noticed that they are doing that. They are, focused, they are going more diaspora, doing shows, because, and I think we need to address that, because they, we are, like, messing up the numbers. We are, we are not making the good, people listen to good music anymore. Like, have, it's been manipulated, and all the artists, Want to like they know that we are not they are not accepting them. They don't just want to be doing that thing over there. I, I don't want to mention names. I still be like, oh, no, I know I know they come Nigeria. I they make my money for that side. I they do my stuff. So I think we should address that aspect. So do you more. feel more artists should place priority on doing local shows and not just uh, this is my U.S. tour or this is my Europe tour? Yes, but I understand them. Just like what I said. Now you drop good music, but you know the way the way, the way things are, the car calls, and you feel like nobody's as specific. Nigerians, their, their taste is high, but at the same time, they can easily get manipulated. So that's the problem. So some other artists that I know, my friend, one of my friends just got back, he traveled back, said, almost, hey, nothing they saw. In drop song, he was trying to promote it, and some people are just making noise with some other songs that are not even, that you know, this song, how did this song get to number one? But, so, but I think, as time goes on, maybe, I don't know what's going to happen, but yeah. That's how, do you, problem. how do you feel about... Um, a lot of the biggest artists signing with um, foreign record labels, foreign management, and then its impact on, say, the economy, because a lot of the monies that are now being made are mm. being made abroad, and that might not necessarily trickle back in to really put in the necessary structure and um, infrastructure needed for this mm. industry. You're so right. And um, I, that, that started some time ago, some years back, you know, when Afrobeat started going. I think about three international label came to my DM, but we weren't really in good, um, the deal wasn't really that, you know, smooth. So we couldn't pay an influencer a million naira to vibe to a song. The other big, they call them big fish, I already to pay her or him 10 million and said, just dump that song for one month. Really? So the game is more like, you have to be on that song. There's a way you have to figure it out. So, so what has influenced your own choice of management, your own choice of um, record label? Yeah, this actually affected me because people that I even blew, my song, like they got to, they got recognized through my song. When I went back to them, they were like, oh, bro, now it's three million, man. Like, it's five million, man. Like, oh, you mean for a collaboration? Because, you know, this, like you said, some other international label are signing Nigerian label. So it's like double money. So they're ready to pay. They're ready to spend just 50 million, I say just, 50 million for just a video. Just one video, 50 million. Imagine that. So you that you are now, you have a budget of 20 million for a song. How do you want people to listen? They can't listen. They can't get it out unless there's a viral TikTok or something that just make the song viral. But aside that, it's hard a bit now. It's not like Is that going to be part of your strategy to come up with, say, a dance step um, or do challenges and to engage influencers to push out your music? That's the vibe. That's, thank God for TikTok. TikTok, they make it easy. So if you know you can't afford to, you know, pack millions of naira and start forcing it, just do the TikTok thing. It, it, if you know what you're doing with some ideas, you can get your song viral. I'm, I'm, I have plans for my song as well. Because, yeah. um, are we expecting a special lady sometime? Are you in a relationship? Do you have someone that you're ready to settle down and maybe say start a family? Uh, settle down. 
No, sister, I'm not sure, but I don't have anybody right now. You know, my past experience has made me relax. I want to like just take my time. You know, don't rush. The right time, you get the right person at the right time. So that's how that's how I see it. And you know, music. You know, are, like I said, there are distractions which I've learned. So I'm trying to focus more on my career. I just just only want hits. I need many hit songs. I have a dream. I know what I, I dream about. I want to perform in, you know, like millions of crowds, international shows and everything. So definitely that is not priority right now. That's so how do you way. deal with all those people sliding into the DMs or waiting at shows and um, wanting to have something yeah. with you? I, I, just, I just learned to overlook. Like, I don't even... I don't even check my DMs. I, you know, what I learned when I went for my therapy is staying away from phone. Phone is very distracting. So I don't really pay attention to DM or anything. What I'm focusing on, on is the music thing because so I make music my, from the scratch. I'm not just an artist, I'm a musician. So I can carry my guitar and start playing something out because it's so why would I have time for? So I, I like my brain is just like the music thing, yeah. All about the music, yeah. and you said in about two months or so we'll be expecting um, either an album or an EP, EP. from you. Um, thank you very much, Alakira, for being here with us on Robbie Minds, and we mm. wish you all the best with the new music coming out. Thank you so much, Alakira. And this is where we'll be wrapping up this episode of Robbie Minds. My name is Isabella Adediji. Do have a good afternoon. Goodbye. Just stand